From Leopold Stokowski to Wolfgang Savalish. The Philadelphia Orchestra has a very, very particular sound, very glorious, voluptuous sound. From Birmingham, England to Bergamo, Italy. Europe is the main center of international music. For 100 years, the Philadelphia Orchestra has been making music. This orchestra, I loved it. I fell in love with them right away. And winning fans the world over. For me, the Philadelphia is on top. Tonight, 6ABC and the Philadelphia Inquirer present the Philadelphia Orchestra Tour of the Century. And now, from the Academy of Music on the Avenue of the Arts, your host, Action News anchor, Jim Gardner. Good evening. And it is indeed a very special evening for the Philadelphia Orchestra. In just about a half hour, maestro Wolfgang Savalish and his musicians will take to this stage and perform the first concert of the orchestra's second century of making music. And tonight also marks the beginning of what will be the final season here at the beloved Academy of Music, home to the orchestra for the past 100 years. The Philadelphia Orchestra performed its first concert on November 16, 1900, with a German-born Fritz Scheele as its first conductor. Throughout the century, as the baton changed hands only a handful of times, the orchestra has repeatedly made history with musical premieres, millions of records, and thousands of concerts performed all over the world. This spring they went to Europe for three weeks, and tonight we take you on that tour where you will see beautiful cities, hear lovely music, and along the way celebrate the rich history of the maestros and the musicians who have made this orchestra one of the best in the world. And now we find ourselves in the private quarters of maestro Wolfgang Savalish, and I can't tell you how delighted we are to have the opportunity to say hello, even though you're just a half hour away from the beginning of the concert. No, thank you very much. I am happy to speak to you and to speak a little bit about all you are asking for. Well, let me ask you first. Yes. Uh, why is it important for an orchestra like the Philadelphia to maintain such an active touring schedule worldwide? No, I think every year it is necessary after the season that we have international tours to bring the orchestra personally to the people, to the audience. The audience normally knows the orchestra by records, or by tapes and so on, but it is so necessary that the orchestra as a life instrument comes to the different countries in the world. And so we had this year a wonderful trip to the music centers of uh, Europe, in London, in Cologne, in Vienna, in Warsaw, in Prague, in Helsinki. And it was really a wonderful opportunity to show what the orchestra is. Tonight is an important night. It's the beginning of the orchestra's second century of making music. Yes, that's not only the birth day season of the Philadelphia Orchestra, it is the first season in the new century. It is I hope so. Uh, the last uh, season in the Academy of Music, because next year we hope to to make music in the new Kimmel Center, and so this is a really important concert to start the new season. We're glad to be with you. Please. We're glad to be with you. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you. Now, over the last seven years as musical conductor, Maestro Savalish has taken the Philadelphia Orchestra all over the world. This past May, we were delighted to tag along for the orchestra's three-week tour of Europe. The musicians are used to spending weeks on the road. They do at least one major tour every year. But this spring's crisscrossing trek across Europe was among the most grueling schedules in years. 12 cities in nine countries for 14 concerts in just 20 days. We'll definitely feel it at the end. And uh, no matter how good friends we are, I'm sure we'll be at each other's throats by the end as well. Can't help it. But in the beginning, at least, they were looking forward to seeing some of the most beautiful places in the world. From big tourist towns like Vienna, London, Paris, and Prague, to lesser known venues like Bergamo, Warsaw, Turin, and Cologne.
from some of the world's most famous halls, playing very old and familiar audience favorites like Beethoven's Fourth Symphony. To a piece never heard before, Eno Yahani Rotabarlo's Eighth Symphony, subtitled The Journey. I think the orchestra is, is probably the thing that's most internationally recognized about Philadelphia in the world. Anywhere we go, I don't think they're aware of our sports teams, but they do know the Philadelphia Orchestra. That is thanks in part to the tradition of touring. For the musicians, it is a way to show off one of Philadelphia's finest products and an absolute necessity for a top-tier orchestra to maintain its stature on the world stage. The orchestra's world travels began in 1949 with a trip to Great Britain. And that's where this year's tour started after a seven-hour flight across the Atlantic. Tonight, as we take you on last spring's European journey, we also get to experience the first concert of the new century, which begins in just about 25 minutes here at the Academy of Music. And when we continue in just a moment, we'll meet the maestro who made the fabulous Philadelphians Hollywood film stars, and later, what happens when a car gets in the way of the show in Poland, when we continue in just a moment. The Philadelphia Orchestra Tour of the Century is sponsored by ABS Cannon and Jacobs Music since 1900, celebrating 100 years of service to the music community in 2000. Cannon. The Philadelphia Orchestra's first 100 years is a rich history that is filled with firsts. Just this week, it was commissioned by NASA to record 2001 A Space Odyssey, which will be broadcast into the Space Shuttle Discovery during the launch on October 5th to mark the 100th mission of the Space Shuttle program. The Philadelphia Orchestra thus becomes the first orchestra in the world to conquer outer space. It was also the first orchestra to appear on nationwide television, the first to have its own commercially sponsored radio broadcast, and the first orchestra to become world famous for its work on a feature film, Walt Disney's Fantasia in 1940. And this Hollywood debut came under the leadership of the orchestra's very first superstar, Leopold Stokowski. It is fitting that the orchestra's centennial tour began in England. It was here, after all, the orchestra's first great conductor, Leopold Stokowski, was born. And it was here he started his musical career. When Stokowski came to Philadelphia in 1912, both he and the orchestra were just babies. The orchestra, 12 years old, Stokowski, 30 with just three years professional experience. But Stokowski was a quick study and a merciless boss in his quest to build a world-class ensemble. When you look at the personnel list, after he came here in 1912, the, uh, the changes were thunderous and a lot of people got fired. Good people got fired. Uh, people were moved from principal to the back of the section. To audiences, Stokowski was like a god, six foot two, good looking, and well dressed, with a halo of golden hair. He had a unique style of conducting without a score or a baton. His gestures and the way he pulled the sound from us was inexplicable. Um, he, he was, it was magic. And he made going to the orchestra fun. On stage, he was known to scold the audience if they made too much noise or fail to show enough appreciation. If you don't like it, you go to hell. Off stage, he was a glamorous, almost cult-like figure who had a knack for being noticed with his outrageous, controversial behavior. He was a kind of magical figure here, and I think he, he represented a, a kind of Philadelphia that uh, people wished the city were. His most lasting achievement was the creation of what has come to be known as the Philadelphia Sound, that trademark rich, lush velvet now known to audiences worldwide. <laughs> opening night of the tour in Birmingham, England, and the opening piece was Antonin Dvorak's powerful and energetic Carnival Overture. Like Stokowski, Dvorak was always eager to try new things. He composed orchestral, chamber, and piano music, wrote lively songs and duets, and mixed classic symphony with the dance rhythms and folk melodies from his native Czechoslovakia. 
out. Let's see if we can do this one, guys. The orchestra's current members share the same diverse musical interests. Okay. I know we'll be Breath here. What happened? <laughs> That's great. Roger Blackburn is by trade a trumpet player. Back in the 1980s, he started recruiting other brass members to sing with him and play ragtime. There's such an atmosphere of gaiety, of fun, uh, being with other guys that enjoy singing and it just uh, it's something that's hard to copy. The symbols should flare out toward the audience. The tour doesn't allow a lot of time for extracurricular activities, but many musicians believe it so, is part of their mandate to itself. pass along the tips and wisdom they've collected should over be. the years. It's, it's a little more energy. That's why a Friday morning in London found a sleep-deprived Michael Bookspan teaching a master class at the Royal College of Music. Michael has been with the Philadelphia Orchestra for 47 years. Okay, now just think about that just for a moment. Some of your parents probably aren't even 47. Though these students are among the best young percussionists in England, most had never met an American musician of Michael's caliber. I've always believed that the students will retain some of what they learned from me, and um, I don't care if they end up thinking they invented it, but I know I'm having some, some effect on them. His tip to the kids, remember the percussion section is on the highly visible top riser. So it's important their performance is pleasing not just to the ear, but to the eye as well. It's a lesson Michael Bookspan learned himself years ago while working under his first boss, the man who stepped in when Stokowski stepped down. In 1969, Herbert Kupferberg wrote a book on the Philadelphia Orchestra and called it Those Fabulous Philadelphians. The nickname stuck. Up next, a beautiful city but a problem-plagued visit, and later the handsome Italian who tried to change that famous Philadelphia sound when we come back. Since the days of Stokowski, the Philadelphia Orchestra has been a destination for the world's best conductors, soloists, and musicians. The players here pride themselves on being an international symphony orchestra with an international audience. Over the years, the orchestra has traveled all over the world, performing in Asia, Central and South America, and of course, Europe, the destination for this past spring's tour. From England, it was on to Paris, the city of light. And throughout the century, it has become the adopted home of many musical luminaries such as Igor Stravinsky, Richard Wagner, and Kurt Weill. The best places often attract the best people, and such is also the story of the Philadelphia Orchestra. When Leopold Stokowski left in 1938, the baton was passed to a man who had been Stokowski's co-conductor the past two years, a Hungarian, born Jeno Blau, but reborn in the United States as Eugene Ormandy. Following in the footsteps of Stokowski, Ormandy had enormous shoes to fill. He told me once that he had never been lonelier in his life in the first two or three years here. That audience still wanted Stokowski. They wanted that kind of magic that he brought, the excitement, and Armandy just couldn't do it, and he, he felt absolutely alone here. But Ormandy soon settled in and stayed an astounding 44 years, the longest tenure of any modern age maestro with a major orchestra. In those early years, Ormandy said his biggest goal was to maintain the great sound Stokowski had created, and Stokowski himself told Ormandy he had succeeded. And he came to me, he said, you know, after the rehearsal, it hasn't changed, it's exactly the same as I left it. It was the most beautiful compliment anybody could make to me. He had an enormous, uh, I mean, it was just a great memory and a very big repertoire. He, he did, uh, I guess somewhere in the area of 30 weeks a year, and, and the majority of the pieces were done from memory. He also continued Stokowski's tradition of introducing new works, including the third piano concerto by fellow Hungarian Bela Bartok. Like Ormandy, Bartok was an emigre, moving to the United States in 1940 to escape the growing Nazi movement. 
He wrote the third piano concerto in his dying days as a gift to his pianist wife. The solo was played on tour by another traveler, Yefim Bronfman. Bronfman was born in Russia, but moved to Israel at the age of 15 after his father was wrongly accused of being a German spy and imprisoned for 10 months. When people found out that I was leaving for Israel, people just were in shock. You know, I remember when I came to say goodbye to my schoolmate, my teacher, in front of the whole um, school said that I was a traitor. A few years later, Bronfman moved to the United States to study music. In 1977, he made his debut with the Philadelphia Orchestra at Robin Hood Dell. Orchestra and soloist have shared a special relationship ever since. To play with Philadelphia Orchestra, it was always a dream of mine and uh, I never take it for granted. 19 of the orchestra's 104 musicians came here from other countries. Harpist Margarita Montanaro was born in Cuba, spent five years in Vienna, and then moved to Philadelphia to study at the Curtis Institute. She has been with the orchestra since 1963. It shows the quality of the orchestra, and uh, our orchestra, being of such a high standard, naturally attracts uh, you know, the very best people. Whether they come from halfway around the world or from right here in Philadelphia, as nearly a third of the orchestra's musicians have. Violist Renard Edwards grew up in West Philadelphia and decided to take lessons after seeing a violinist on television. But they didn't have any more violins. They only had a viola. And I didn't know the difference. <laughs> but it looked like a violin. So I said, I'll take it. <laughs> we caught up with Renard enjoying a rare day off at a castle-like hotel on a hill overlooking Zurich. Joining the orchestra has given him the chance to see the world. <laughs> but being on tour is not the same as being a tourist. We're just beginning the more difficult legs where we stop and start and stop and start. In many cities, the only sightseeing is the sights seen on the walk from hotel to concert hall. It's not a vacation because you have to play concerts, which is our job. So instead of sightseeing, you need to practice because if you don't practice for some time, your fingers start to feel like overcooked noodles. They also need to eat and sleep, which is at times a real challenge. The orchestra was in and out of Paris, for example, in just 16 hours, and there was a terrible snafu at the hotel. Not enough rooms were ready. Some musicians didn't get one until after the concert was over, and others got one that had already been given to someone else. One violinist walked into her room and found a stranger's underwear hanging all over the place. Most were frankly not amused. You know, you have a, a night like last night with very little sleep to begin with, and, and then a long trip, and then not having the rooms ready is very difficult. It was Eugene Ormandy who first introduced the fabulous Philadelphians to the world with international touring to Europe, Latin America, Japan, and Korea. In 1973, they became the first American orchestra to perform in the People's Republic of China. But by then, Ormandy was beginning to show signs of his age, and in 1980, his hand-picked successor would become the orchestra's next maestro. A full house has turned out for this opening night gala, paying as much as $700 a ticket to hear the orchestra play. And we can talk now to some of the folks who have come here tonight. You are. Good evening, Jim. I'm Sydney Stevens, president of the volunteer committees for the Philadelphia Orchestra. What do volunteers do? Well, this is the kickoff for our season, and we do, of the 550 volunteers, we do seasons of events all year long. Thank you. We're delighted to be here. And, and we're glad to have you here. Thank you, Jim. You, you are. Hi, I'm Joseph Conyers. And what do you do? I'm here at the Curtis Institute of Music setting in Philadelphia. I'm from Savannah, Georgia, but I was drawn to Philadelphia because of Curtis and its wonderful connection with the Philadelphia Orchestra. It's one of the things that makes Curtis special. It's nice to talk to you. And you are? Hannah Kim. And your role here tonight? I'm just an orchestra lover. A patron. A patron. It's a big night, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's nice to see you. Thank you. We have much more to come when we continue right here at the Academy of Music on the Avenue of the Arts. When we come back, 
It is a concert in street clothes when the trucks get stuck on the road to Warsaw. And later on, it is on to Nordic country and a new piece for a new season. When we continue in just a moment. And so the man who took the baton from Eugene Ormandy was Italian-born Riccardo Muti. He was a committed leader who was determined to remake the ensemble. He wanted to introduce the audience to works they had never heard before, and he tried to take the orchestra to places it had never been before. <laughs> For most of the musicians, Warsaw, Poland lacks the obvious charms of Paris or Vienna, but for tuba player Paul Krzywicki, it was the highlight of the tour. Now I recognize it, okay. When Paul first came to Poland in 1983, the country was still under communist control, and he was visiting relatives that he had never met. There was not one single awning, not one single chair and place to eat. There was the only thing that was anything at all to do with something commercial was a little horse and carriage that used to take people around. In the 17 years since, Poland has turned to capitalism, and Paul and his cousin Derek have become close friends. Remember when we saw these underground, all the women selling underground illegally? And when the orchestra last came to Warsaw in 1997, Paul passed around maps and touristy tidbits on the food, language, and history of his homeland. It's my roots, you know, all my grandparents came from here. It's just I can't help but feel really nostalgic. I mean, it's great fun to just come back. And it's, and it's becoming one of the nicer, nicer towns in, in Europe, I think. While touring often takes the musicians to little-known places, the orchestra's fifth music conductor, Riccardo Muti, liked to introduce the audiences to new and unfamiliar works. And the Italian-born Muti came to Philadelphia at a time when the orchestra desperately needed him. The last few years, uh, Ormandy uh, mentally was not quite the same as he had been. So uh, things started to go a little bit downhill. Moody was a glamorous young Italian who wowed the mainline women with his onstage performance and that incredible head of hair. He brought energy and intensity to the orchestra and outraged some by trying to stifle that omnipresent Philadelphia sound. And when he said the Philadelphia sound, what is it? It's just public relations. People died in the streets. It was just, can you imagine anyone saying such a thing? But it was true. I mean, they, with him, he wanted the orchestra to play Mozart in a way that had a different quality from Mahler. American audiences didn't always appreciate the temperamental Italian, but in Europe, Muti was received as something of a hero, generating excitement wherever the orchestra appeared. On this European tour, though, the orchestra itself created the stir. The trucks carrying all of the instruments and wardrobes were too high for a bridge on the road from Cologne to Warsaw. The trucks were forced to reroute and didn't arrive until 8.05, five minutes after the concert was to have started. The stage crew worked furiously to unload the instruments, and when a car got in the way, a dozen poles moved it with their own hands. They got all of the equipment off the trucks, and the musicians were ready to play just 40 minutes later. We were just there, wandering around, waiting for the trunks to arrive, and when they did, we had 10, 15 minutes, okay, on stage, that's it, doing it. But they were doing it in their street clothes. There was no time to unload the wardrobe trunks. One violinist tried to wear a Who's Your Daddy t-shirt, but management made him find something a bit more suitable. The audience forgave the weight and the dress code. The performance featuring Respighi's The Birds was among the best played and best received concerts on tour. We don't look like like a touring orchestra. I mean, we, we look like some kind of a, <laughs> a band with street clothes. And so we, we want to show them that, you know, we do a great job regardless or despite the situation. For the musicians and the managers, the excitement and audience response was a much needed pick-me-up at the midway point of an exhausting tour. For the stage crew, though, it was yet another hurdle on an already challenging trip. Yeah, and we were smoking. <laughs> I got it all in, though. 
For them, a tour of Europe means hauling 10 tons of equipment worth millions of dollars through 12 cities with some very small concert halls. I'm just gonna need a few guys for this far, okay? This was a tough tour, because it's a lot of one-nighters. You know, uh, the stages are small. These are big orchestras, Strauss and um, Shostakovich, big pieces, you know, and uh, it's tough to fit everybody. And the crew has to be very careful with the contents. A violin bow alone can run $20,000, and some of the violins, hundreds of years old, are priceless. Six of these, they'll all be together. Eddie Barnes has been the orchestra's stage crew manager for 14 years. As with many musicians, it is a career that runs in his family. Eddie's father was stage manager before him for 30 years. He was joined by his brother Jimmy six years ago. And Jim Sweeney, the third member of the crew, is also the son of a stagehand. As hard as the musicians work, these guys work even harder. Each day they get up, eat breakfast, take a plane, train, or bus to the next city, check into the hotel, head for the hall, and set up for the concert. After the concert is over, the crew breaks down and prepares to start all over again in the morning. When people ask you, uh, you know, how, how was the tour when you go to these exotic places, that's basically what you see. You see an airport, a hotel, a hall, a hotel, and you're out of there. It was the constant travel that finally got to Ricardo Muti. Unlike Ormandy, who devoted his life to Philadelphia, Muti split his time between the United States and Italy. After 12 years with the Philadelphia Orchestra, he tired of the constant jet lag and the attention paid to things like his hair, his failure to smile after performances, and his personality, which some considered cold. In 1992, he left the city, making way for the maestro who leads the orchestra today. In just a few moments, Wolfgang Savalash will start the first concert of the orchestra's second century, and we'll listen in when we come back. Plus, it's a flashback in Finland for the fabulous Philadelphians, and a little later, the search for a successor to Maestro Savalash. Welcome back to the Academy of Music. The Philadelphia Orchestra has just taken the stage. It is now playing the overture to Deflate Her Mouse by Johann Strauss Jr. Translated literally, it means the bat. Maintaining a world-class orchestra is a very expensive proposition. In fact, this year's budget is $35 million. One way to increase audience interest and therefore ticket sales is with new music. And over the years, the ensemble has premiered more than 300 pieces. The orchestra continued that tradition this year by commissioning a new work for its centennial season. <laughs> and hold to last D note, hold to last. It sounds much better. And you. The orchestra started its third and final week of the tour with a three-day stop in Helsinki. And to the music-loving Finns, the arrival of the Philadelphians was really big news. Not only had a major orchestra come to town, but they would be premiering a new piece written by a hometown composer. Eino Yahani Rahavara is a virtual unknown in the United States, but in Finland, he is, as one newspaper reporter put it, a prophet among us. We are very happy, really very happy, to have one important piece more. The orchestra commissioned Rahavara to write his eighth symphony, subtitled The Journey, for its centennial season. The piece made its European debut in Cologne the week before in a performance that was broadcast live on German television. Like his predecessors, Maestro Wolfgang Savalish is constantly searching for new talent and fresh music. Since hundreds of years, all or many important works were, uh, were commissioned. Works in the Bach time, in the Mozart time, Beethoven time. Savalish has been Philadelphia's music director since 1993 but has announced plans to step down as soon as his successor is found. He is considered the world's premier interpreter of Richard Strauss. 
and at 77 is described by musicians as a decisive man who knows what he wants and shuns the limelight. The music is what's important to him. Now, this is, I, I, this is my opinion. Uh, he, he's only interested in getting the best out of the music. It is an attitude that commands a tremendous amount of respect from the musicians, a good number of whom would prefer that he never leave. Savalish has been an unbelievable artistic influence on the orchestra, and I think that's something that the musicians really appreciate, and maybe not everybody is aware of just the total impact it had on the orchestra. Many believe he will be remembered for bringing back the lush Philadelphia sound and for hiring a pool of very talented principal players. It's finding someone who plays well is one thing, but finding someone who plays well with these people is something else. And uh, he has had a very keen perception of who those, the right person should be. The 37-year-old concertmaster, David Kim, was hired by Savalosh at the start of last season. For most violinists, it would be a stunning achievement, the top job in a major orchestra at such a young age. But for David, who had trained his whole life to be a concert soloist, taking the position meant giving up the dream. But now that I'm in it, I feel like I wish I decided a long time ago because I love it so much and I feel like it really suits me, suits my character, suits my personality. As concertmaster, David's job is part ceremonial. He signals for the tuning before the concert and shakes the maestro's hand. And it is part leadership. He must prepare the bowings for the violins, give his section some direction, and play lots of solos. And that's why I have the freedom to move a little bit more while I play. Uh, whereas if I was sitting in the very back and I was moving as much as I do now, people would probably accuse me of hot-dogging a little bit. <laughs> it's also up to David to make sure the orchestra is ready to tackle new pieces such as the Rahavara. And he was among 30 musicians who accepted an invitation to lunch at the composer's home. For just a few players of a certain age, it was like deja vu. In 1955, during the orchestra's first ever trip to Helsinki, about 100 musicians went to the home of another celebrated Finnish composer, Jean Sibelius. Sibelius's home was too small to accommodate everybody, so only Eugene Ormandy went inside. The rest stood on the lawn, hoping for just a glimpse. We were standing in a light rain with our coats on, but it was still a, a thrill to be there, to see the living composer, even if we didn't have a chance to talk to him as, as we did today with Mr. Rodovara. But Rodovara and his symphony didn't seem to generate the same enthusiasm. Privately, musicians griped about the piece, complaining that it was a journey to nowhere and a work that covers no new ground. And even the local critics were short of enthusiastic, calling the journey a new variation on a successful recipe. But new pieces are often unloved at first, and commissioning new works is a necessary risk if the orchestra is to find new music for the contemporary music market. It is also one way to boost audience interest in the 21st century. In Philadelphia, the orchestra is hoping the building of a new hall and the hiring of a new maestro will be another. And we return to the lobby of the Academy of Music with the president of the Philadelphia Orchestra, Joe Kluger. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you, Jim. Joe, so much has been written and said about the search for a successor to Wolfgang Savalish. You don't hear too much from the orchestra itself on the status of that search. Can you tell us anything at all? Well, it's a little bit like sausage making, which is uh, it's a, a, a process that we want to make sure is done in the right kind of way and that produces a great result. One of the great things we have with Maestro Savalish is someone who understands his responsibility to help us identify a successor, and he's given us the freedom to take our time to do it because he's prepared to stay around as long as it takes until we find the right person. Philadelphia does have some competition in the search. New York is looking for a new musical director. Boston, um, there's competition on the horizon. Competition is the world we live in in the 21st century. What we think we have in Philadelphia is not only a fabulous sounding orchestra, but a package that includes a fantastic new concert hall, an ability to bring our best programs and showcase them in New York and other cities around the world. And we think we're going to be able to attract uh, the right kind of person for our orchestra. Is it important to get a name known around the world or possibly a younger person who can create his own reputation or her reputation here in Philadelphia? Um, 
we're looking for an individual who can inspire the musicians and inspire the audiences consistently, uh, and also someone who's prepared to make a real commitment to our orchestra and, our, and to our region as m making this post his top professional priority. And I think finding that individual uh, is the most important thing. Stokowski only had three years of professional experience before he started. I think this is not, uh, we, we live in, in a, we're working in an in international business and there are people out there that may not be known to Philadelphians but who are really going to meet our criteria and enable us to maintain our world class excellence in the next century. Joe, thanks. Nice to see you. Thank you and we'll be back with more on the Philadelphia Orchestra when we continue in just a moment. The 100-year anniversary is a time for celebration and significant change. The orchestra is getting a new maestro and next season, a new home. As the orchestra enters the 21st century, it must find new ways to attract a whole new generation of fans if the next 100 years are to be as successful as the first. For as long as there has been a Philadelphia orchestra, Beethoven has been the bedrock of the repertoire. On tour, the Fourth Symphony entertained audiences all across Europe, from the orchestra's first stop in England to its last in Bergamo, Italy, where the hall was so hot the musicians played without jackets. Nearly 200 years after the German composer's death, the sound of his music is guaranteed to keep that core audience coming back. But if the ensemble is to appeal to new audiences, they face a difficult question. Can they continue to rely on 18th and 19th century music as they enter the next millennium? I think orchestras are in a very a very tenuous position right now, and if they can see only the past, then they'll have no future. Violists Sid Curtis and Anna Marie Peterson represent both past and future. Sid is a senior member with the orchestra since 1960. He's been a fabulous Philadelphian longer than she's been alive. Anna Marie is a young mother who just turned 30 and just joined the orchestra eight years ago. She is one of 36 new musicians. Fully one-third of the ensemble arrived on the Philadelphia stage in the last decade. It's nice for me to have more people my age, you know, in the orchestra and on tours. When Anna Marie looks to the future, she sees uncertainty. The musicians are getting a new maestro and a new hall. But Sid, a 40-year veteran looking forward to retiring, can't wait to try out the new hall before he goes. What it sounds like is going to be the most important thing. And uh, I'm hoping that all the new marketing campaigns that are going out to bring in new audiences will work. The musicians got a taste of what it might sound like in Birmingham, England. The hall there was designed by Russell Johnson, the same acoustician who designed Philadelphia's new hall. Johnson paid a surprise visit to Birmingham and promised the musicians that their new hall would be like this, only better. It'll be a brother hall, and there'll be similarities, but there'll also be quite a few differences in the sound. The musicians can only hope that's true. During rehearsal, the acoustics were so frighteningly loud you could hear clothing rustle when violinists lowered their bows. That night, the arrival of the audience soaked up some of the sound in the hall, but on stage, many musicians were still having a tough time. I couldn't hear anything in front of me or anything in back of me, but I could hear everything to the side, and I heard everything going on in the audience. The exact opposite is true in the much-loved Academy of Music, known as the Grand Old Lady of Locust Street. It opened in 1857 as an opera house, and in fact, it's the oldest continuously operating opera house in the country. But the proscenium arch traps the sound on stage so the players hear each other beautifully, but the acoustics in the hall are very dry. The Philadelphia Orchestra has a very, very particular sound, very glorious, voluptuous sound. And it's kind of ironic that Philadelphians haven't had the opportunity to hear it 
in all its glory. Calls for a hall designed specifically for the symphony are almost as old as the orchestra itself. As early as 1908, newspaper articles talked about the need. In the 20s, Leopold Stokowski tried to make it happen. I guess they called it a temple of music at that time and had identified a site on what is now the Four Seasons Hotel in Logan Circle. And unfortunately, that plan never materialized because of the stock market crash at the time. Maestro Moody was the one who finally pushed the plan through. And in the late 1980s, the orchestra bought a plot of land at Broad and Spruce Streets, just one block from the Academy. It would be a decade later before demolition crews, with much fanfare, began knocking down the old to make way for the new. When the $255 million Kimmel Center for the Performing Arts opens its doors in December 2001, Philadelphia audiences should finally be able to hear what the rest of the world has been raving about. It's going to be velvet, which is the way our sound has been described when we go all over the, the world and play in great halls. That is the Philadelphia sound. But the orchestra hopes that the new 2,500-seat hall will bring more than just a new listening experience. They want it to be a destination with its shops and restaurants, a central meeting place on the Avenue of the Arts. They figure initial curiosity will draw in the crowds and hope an exciting new maestro can keep them coming back. Just as Beethoven has captivated generations of listeners the world over, the orchestra hopes that new generations of Philadelphia listeners will find new ways to make classical music a part of their lives. will play its first concert in the new Kimmel Center for the Performing Arts on December 15, 2001. The hall is named for Sidney Kimmel, who donated $15 million to the project. Kimmel grew up in West Philadelphia as the son of a cab driver. He amassed his fortune as founder of the women's clothing company, Jones Apparel. And while Kimmel is not a lover of classical music, he has given an extraordinary gift to Philadelphians who are. Back in a moment with more of the Philadelphia Orchestra. has been sponsored by ABS Cannon and Jacobs Music since 1900, celebrating 100 years of service to the music community in 2000. The orchestra's centennial celebration will reach its high point on November 16th, 100 years after its very first concert. The ensemble will celebrate with a birthday gala and concert that will be broadcast to an audience around the world. If you would like more information about the Philadelphia Orchestra and its upcoming season, you can call 215-893-1999. I'm glad you could be with us for tonight's program here at the Academy of Music on the Avenue of the Arts. And we leave you with more of the world-renowned Philadelphia Orchestra. I'm Jim Gardner. Good night.